As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can now see, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said, we know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. You're wondering how the pastor can still jump up onto the stage. That's (laughs) such an age. Um, it is a blessing to um, uh, thank you for your kind uh, wishes and embarrassing song. Uh, it is a blessing to be able to um, speak about um, the gift uh, God gives us of eternal life. Uh, what a present that is, uh, and the one we really should be focused on now. Let's pray. Father, Uh, Thank you for uh, this chapter in John's Gospel. We do pray that um, you will give us that miracle of sight that is needed now to see you, Jesus, for who you are and to worship you. Uh, We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This really, as we work through John's Gospel, is one of the most memorable stories in the Gospel. Uh, It's a delightful story. It it really draws you in. It really plays out kind of like a three-act play with these different characters and scenes with uh, the the blind man and his neighbors and then the Pharisees 
uh, grilling people, and then Jesus at the end. And uh, uh, there's a wonderful arc in that story. But I want to just take a minute for us to get our bearings uh, before we dive a little bit deeper into the story. Remember, we're going through John's gospel. And um, <clears throat> remember that John has carefully selected seven miraculous signs, which appear in the first 11 chapters of John's gospel. This is the sixth one. And each of them has a particular, each of them for forms part of his uh, particular purpose for the entire gospel. And I say this again and again, John 20, 30, 31 is the key to understanding all of these signs, where he says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The purpose of these miraculous signs is twofold, identity and response. What is the identity? The identity is, uh, uh, that uh, John wants you to see is who Jesus is, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then the response is that by believing you may have life in his name. And the identity factor is big here uh, in this, in this uh, miraculous story that happens in John chapter 9. And it's the, the, <clears throat> the disciples' question in verse 1 and verse 2 is the catalyst for this miraculous sign and the revealing of Jesus' identity. Uh, he sees this man blind from birth. And the disciples of Jesus ask him in verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, why the disciples ask that question relates to um, a very common belief amongst the rabbis in that first century. It was actually a pretty normal belief in Jewish uh, faith in those days that whatever happened to you, if there was something terrible that happened to you or some illness or disease that happened to you, it was as a result of some sin in your life. Uh, and then the question came, well, what happens, uh, what kind of sin is involved in babies that are born with some sort of deformity or blindness or something like that? And the, the rabbis were divided into two groups, that some said, you're born that way because of the sins of the fathers, and others said, you're born that way because you did some sin in the womb, like you had some impure thought about your mother in the uterus or something like that. And as ridiculous as that is, those were the theological positions that they maintained. And those were the two schools of thought uh, <clears throat> that dominated Jewish thinking in that first century. And so they come to Jesus as rabbi and say, well, which, which side are you on in this? Which side are you on? And of course, Jesus says, don't go down that road, you know? Neither this man nor his parents sin. That's not the reason for this. It's quite a startling reply from Jesus in that day. But Jesus is not here to entertain a foolish debate. And th this is a bit of a distraction. But let me say this. You cannot argue for what is essentially karma from Scripture. Because that's what, that's, what that's what these Jewish people believe. This doesn't come from the Hindus. This is a common pagan superstition that pervades all religion. And I'm telling you, even in Christian circles, there are Christians who hold to some sort of weird superstition that is really Christian karma. You know, what goes around comes around. Whatever you do comes back to you. That's not biblical. And you cannot say all the time that what something has happened to you because of some sin or curse in your life. That's not how God works. That's karma. That's not biblical. Yes, there are instances where God does discipline his people through illness or, 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 or some sort of uh, difficulty. Uh, uh, um, James chapter 5, 1 Corinthians 11. But you can't make that a blanket rule. You can't make that a blanket rule. Sometimes there are other divine purposes at work. And the reality is there are some times where something terrible happens to you that is not linked to you directly at all in any way. And if you don't think that's the case, then you must take Job out of your Bibles. You know, one of the worst things I ever heard in a church was a prophetess prophesying over a couple in the church who were, who were struggling to have children. And she declared boldly into the microphone that God had shown her that they were under a curse because one of the grandparents was a Freemason and she was there to break that curse. It's one of the most wicked things I've ever heard said in a church. What a terrible thing to say to a couple struggling with infertility. That is, that is superstitious karma. That is not biblical. Just think about this, my friends. If we all got what we deserved, if what goes around comes around, why are we still alive? 
All right. Back to John chapter 9. Please don't let anyone tell you under a curse because your dad's a Freemason. What did we just sing? What did John A. tell us? If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. There's nothing that the cross, there's no curse that the cross does not cover. Anyway, Jesus replies, verse 3. Uh, that's not karma. Um, <laughs> verse 3. Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. This has got nothing to do with whatever this man sinned. Don't go that way. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, so that Jesus may be seen for who he really is. Verse 4. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He has the identity. And of course, this is the big theme in John's gospel. Jesus is the light of the world. John 1 verse 9 in the prologue. That um, uh, 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 the light, that the true light that gives light to every man, to every person, is coming into the world. Uh, that's going to be a big theme of our Christmas celebrations. Uh, the chapter just before this, chapter 8 verse 12. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so Jesus comes to this particular healing with this statement of identity. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. I'm the light of the world, and I'm going to show you just what that means. The light that gives light to all people. And it's that identity that John wants you to see here of Jesus, that he is the light that gives life to the world, a divine light that gives light to the world. And this miracle brings that out. And it also, secondly, brings out the responses to Jesus, the right and the wrong responses to Jesus. And you see them here. There's four different responses to Jesus uh, in this healing miracle. The first response is confusion. Uh, this man gets healed by Jesus, uh, and then he comes home seeing, and uh, there's clearly confusion. Verse 8, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself said, I'm the man. You can just imagine the scene. They're all like arguing amongst each other. Is he? Isn't he? I don't know. Hello, it's me. It's me. And I can see you all now. I mean, I'm, su I'm not surprised it is confusing. I mean, if my blind neighbor, you know, drove his Ferrari up the driveway one morning, I'd be pretty confused. You know, I'd think, has he got a twin brother? Is there something I'm missing here? You know, I'd think of other seemingly more logical explanations. So I understand the confusion. And there's confusion and debate, not just amongst the neighbors, but amongst the religious leaders. They're saying, no, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The intervention of Jesus in someone's life will always cause this response. Will always cause this response. If you're truly born again, if you've truly come to faith in Jesus, it's going to cause some confusion with people around you. People will notice. There's something different about you. If you've come to Jesus later in life, people may notice it and go, you know, but uh, John doesn't go out drinking with us anymore. What's going on with him? I don't know what's going on. He's gone weird. or anything like that. There's going to be all this confusion about it. That's what happens. If Jesus intervenes in your life, people will notice. And it may cause confusion. It may cause people to question. It should cause people to question that there's something different about you. A saving encounter with Jesus will change you. People will notice. And the intervention of Jesus in people's lives should cause questions. And by the way, um, if you're watching this online or if you have with those questions, you're in the right place. This is where you come with your confusion and your questions. The other response to the intervention of Jesus in this man's life is fear. The parents of the healed man are put under the spotlight here by the religious leaders. They start asking questions. They can't get a straight answer from the healed man. Actually, they can't get the answer that they want from the healed man. So they turn to the parents in verse 19. They say, is this the son you say was born blind? How can he now see? So they're, they're questioning them. Oh, were you lying to us? Did you say that your son was born blind? You just put dark glasses on him to, to rip us off and beg money off us and make easy money? Uh, were, were you conning us? So they're putting the, the parents under pressure here. And the parents, of course, are afraid because these are the religious leaders. These are the community leaders. They hold great power in this village, in this community where they're at. They're afraid of them. Look at verse 20. We know he is our son, the parents answered. And uh, we know he was born blind, but how he can see now? Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Um, ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. So these parents really didn't stand up for their son very much. Um, and by the way, in that Jewish culture, being of age is 13. 
So, you know, no, we, we don't know. Ask him. He's 14. He can speak for himself. You know? They're, they're throwing him under the bus a little here because they're afraid to actually stand up and say, hey, God has done something here. And why? Verse 22 tells us. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. You see that? The fact that John even mentions that. The parents never said that. But this is the unsaid rumor. This is the unsaid rumor of the day. That everyone around us going, hang on a minute, maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is the Messiah. But nobody's going to say it because the, the Pharisees have such power over the community. They're too afraid to say it out loud because they'll be expelled from the synagogue. Now, that may not sound like much today. If a church kicks you out, you've got another 150 just in this area that you can go to. No one's going to make any big deal about that. But in those days, if you're kicked out of the synagogue, you're, you're kicked out of the community. You're out. You're shunned. Uh, you're cut off. Your business uh, connections, your family connections, everything's gone. Uh, these Pharisees controlled all of that. And so there was great fear here um, in naming, even saying maybe he's the Messiah. There's great fear involved in this. So the parents throw their son under the bus and say, no, no, you have to ask him. He knows. Yeah, he's of age. Um, by the way, this is another common response uh, that I've seen to Jesus. That um, when you start sharing the gospel with someone, you start telling them about Jesus. And the realization comes. And they start to see, you can actually see it in their eyes. They almost start to back off a little bit. They get afraid because they're starting to think, hang on a minute. If I come to faith in this Jesus, he's inviting me to come to faith. And it means I'm going to lose my friends. I'm going to lose my reputation. My drinking buddies are going to look down on me weirdly. And um, my family don't want to know me anymore. And you're going to be thinking about all those things as uh, you think about what it means to put your faith in Jesus. And I've seen this so often, people get afraid, and they like back off and they shut the door and they say, I'll call you later, or something like that. They don't want to make that step, because they're more afraid of men than they are of God. And I tell you why people do this, because they don't actually see who Jesus really is. They don't see who Jesus is, they're getting an inkling, something to, f to scare them a little bit. But they don't see the greatness of who he really is, because I tell you this. When Jesus opens your eyes, opens your eyes to see who he really is and the greatness of what he brings to you, that pros and cons list will go out the window. You won't even think about it. You won't even think about it when you really behold Jesus for who he is. You're not going to go, mm, maybe, okay, okay, I'll try. That's not going to happen. And so these parents back away. Because they don't really, they haven't got the courage to name Jesus for who he really is. And that's again part of their blindness. And part of the blindness of all who back away from Jesus instead of come to faith in him. Thirdly, and um, sadly the worst reaction to Jesus from these religious leaders is unbelief. Um, remember, these Pharisees were more than pastors. They were the community authorities of the day, kind of like a combination of a law enforcement officer and a magistrate and a theologian and a pastor. They had great um, uh, authority over people in that first century Jewish world. And here they're showing some incredibly blind unbelief in the face of this most amazing miracle. And the, the, the extent of their blindness is seen in how they nitpick um, <clears throat> about rule breaking instead of celebrating a miracle. And Jesus does this deliberately. I mean, did you see how he healed the blind guy? He spits at the ground, he spits into the mud, he makes this place, he puts it on the man's eyes, sends him off to the pool to go and wash. He doesn't need to do any of those things. He doesn't need to do any of those things. With a word, he could have healed that blind man. With a word. But Jesus is sitting up a scenario for the Pharisees to make a decision. Setting up a scenario for the Pharisees to make a decision. It's the Sabbath. One of the nitpicking laws that they had was you're not allowed to knead on the Sabbath because that's works. You can't knead dough or make bricks or anything like that. So Jesus spitting on the ground, making a paste out of the mud, kneading it together, that's working. And so when they see the blind man healed, you know what they say? Who made these mud pies? <laughs> Who made these mud pies on the Sabbath? Come on now, out with it. I mean, how blind can you be? 
that you cannot see the miraculous intervention of God before your very eyes, and you're more concerned about somebody making mud pies. Welcome to Religion 101. These Pharisees, of all people, should have seen the reality of what was happening in front of their eyes. They'd been talking about it. It's all over, the, all over the Old Testament scriptures, all over the Hebrew scriptures. The Messianic age comes when the lame walk, John chapter 5, when the blind see, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 42. Face to face with the startling miracle, verse 18, the Jewish leaders still did not believe you see that, my friends? The root of their problem, these religious leaders, these priests and bishops of the day, the root of their problem was not their obsessive piety. The root of the problem was not theological caution or academic debate. The root of their problem was not even overzealous legalism. The root of their problem was blind unbelief. Unbelief. These Pharisees were hell-bent, literally. They were hell-bent on rejecting Jesus, regardless of how much evidence lay before them. Oh, yeah, I'm becoming an old man. <clears throat> and it's still the same today, by the way. You know, apologetics is important, and, and <clears throat> archaeology and all those things are very important. But none of those things are actually going to convince people to become Christians. You can argue till you're blue in the face for someone. They're not going to come to Jesus because of, it, it, it's a spiritual problem. It's not an academic problem. It's not a historical problem. It's not an apologetics problem. It's none of those things. It's a spiritual problem. <coughs> and blind eyes need to be opened by divine intervention. And these Pharisees won't see it. And they bring the man again. They, they keep Hammering him, verse 24, tell the truth. We know this man was a sinner. They're putting him under oath. And they're even giving them words to say. Here's the words we want you to say under oath. This man is a sinner. And he goes, probably one of the greatest replies in all of Scripture, verse 25. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. So that's his testimony. I can't, give you, I can't tell you everything about Jesus. I haven't got all the answers to all of the particular theological questions. But I know this. This man, Jesus, intervened in my life and I was blind. And now I see. No, they can't deny that. They can't deny that. Your personal experience of saving faith in Jesus cannot be denied. Once I was blind, but now I see. That's not good enough for these religious leaders. Let's read on, verse 26. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. This is very brave of this young man. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> this is sarcastic, really, isn't it? <laughs> um, then they hurled insults at him and said, uh, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. How this blind man is becoming quite enlightened, formerly blind man. The man answered, now that is remarkable. Uh, you don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, he listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. I mean, that's remarkable insight. For a man who's been blind is a lot. Clearly he's been listening. To this, the religious leaders reply, verse 34, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So they're going back to the argument. See, back to verse 1 and 2. No, 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 you were born blind. Oh, you must be some terrible sin in your life. Get out. How dare you tell us what to say? Actually, Amate, our resident theologian and singer, just pointed out to me between the services a very interesting observation that um, if, the, if, if his blindness was the cause of his sin, isn't the fact that he's healed now the cause of his forgiveness? I better watch out. My job is under threat. But he's right. How can a sinner do God's work? 
and he gets, and he gets kicked out for that truthful observation. It's quite sad and tragically ironic that the man's given the gift of sight, and now the Pharisees won't let anyone see him. And what the Pharisees teach us here again is the blindness of pride, the blindness of religious pride, the, blind, the blindness of earthly pride. Um, and it happens, and, and it, it's an easy thing to fall into. You know, we, it's quick to point fingers at the Pharisees, but actually, we very easily place pride in our positions or our status. Um, uh, and that can very easily blind us, actually, to, to some things that we can miss. And particularly when it comes to Jesus, your education is not going to help you see Jesus. Your Bible knowledge is not going to put you in the front row seats to see Jesus. Your church leadership position in the church is not going to help you. Fancy uh, church titles, not going to give you a, an inside track, religious pedigree, ethnic pedigree, whatever you want to claim. That does not give you any um, inside track as far as a relationship with Jesus goes. None of those things. Because your fundamental problem is not your earthly circumstances or your earthly advantages. Your fundamental problem is a spiritual circumstance. It's a spiritual blindness. And you see this in the contrast between the stubborn blindness of these religious elite and the growing sight of the once blind beggar. Well, you see, fourthly and lastly, this climactic response of faith. What you see with the blind man is, uh, is actually a miracle and another miracle. This, he's healed of his physical blindness. And then you see a gradual enlightenment coming upon him. At first, he doesn't know much, verse 11. His name is Jesus. He healed me. Verse 17, I think he's a prophet. Verse 25, hey, I can tell you this. Once I was blind, but now I see. Verse 33, actually, if this man was not from God, he could do nothing. There's a growing enlightenment with this man. <clears throat> Until in the final scene, Jesus reappears. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, the man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. My friends, he has the second miracle of sight in this story. He has the second miracle of sight. The first is his eyes were physically restored. The second miracle is that he got to see Jesus for who he really is. And that word son of man, by the way, carried great weight in the first century. Uh, it relates to Daniel 7 with this divine ruler coming on the clouds of heaven, ruling um, on the throne of the kingdom, taking power over all heaven and earth as, the, as king and judge. And this is the one that this man bows the knee to, worships and says, Lord, I believe, which is a forerunner to John 20, 28, when Thomas is going to declare at the climax of the whole gospel, my Lord and my God. Two Jewish men bowing the knee to a man and worshiping him, unheard of, unspeakable blasphemy, unless that man is none other than God himself. And there's the true response to recognition in John's gospel. I believe and worship. But you see two responses here at the end. Jesus says in verse 39, in line with the son of man title, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. See, there's great irony in this whole story. The blind man, the blind beggar sees. And the seeing bishop is blind. The great irony is, the one's blindness will bring his judgment. And the other one's sight brings his salvation. I don't know if you thought of this just as we wrap up. But in this entire story, Jesus is actually not present a lot. If this was a three-act play, the main act is two. Jesus is not there. He's gone from verse 7, and he only appears again in verse 35. He's off the scene. He's off the scene as all of this drama is taking place. And actually, that's very much how it goes now. That's very much how it goes on now. 
that Jesus is out of sight. And yet, all of the drama taking place is about Jesus. And in between all of this drama, unseen in the world's eyes, Jesus is meeting people one on one and opening their eyes to see him. That's what's happening. That's what's happening here. That in the midst of all of this confusion, one on one, Jesus is meeting people through a personal intervention, and they are saved. It's such an encouragement for me to be reading this this week because I tell you, I've been so discouraged when I look at the world and when I look at the state of the visible church on earth and scandal after scandal and disaster after disaster and yet another disaster with uh, the Anglican church. Now, the archbishop himself has had to step down over an abuse scandal that involved someone that actually some years ago tried to join our church and now it's caused an international incident. And the archbishop himself has had to step down. Again and again you see this. Again and again you see this. And it's very easy to become discouraged because very often the religious leaders are the most hard-hearted. And the institution becomes, the, the, the institution that should be pointing us to Jesus can very easily become the one that points us away from him. Because they embrace the world and all the other worldly values. But she has the great encouragement in this. In all of this confusion, in all of this blindness, in all of this institutional stupidity, One by one, Jesus is meeting you. One by one, he is coming to see you. As his word is proclaimed, he opens your eyes through a divine miracle of sight that you may see Jesus as the light of the world and cry out to him, Lord, I believe, and worship him. How can that happen if you go by the world? If you look at the world, you'd say, that's crazy. But when you have met Jesus... Nothing the world says will change that. Nothing. When you have met Jesus, you will say, Lord, I believe. And you will worship him. Is that you? Is that you watching online? Maybe today he has opened your eyes to see him. Will you respond to him? Will you stop putting it up? Will you stop prevaricating? Will you respond to him? Come, let's pray. Oh, a miracle of sight is what we need to see you, Jesus. No amount of education, no amount of church attendance, no amount of reading, no amount of connections, number of connections. It is a miracle of sight from your spirit. And Lord, will you give that to us today, Lord? As your word has been opened and we see Jesus. For who he is, oh, may we bow the knee to him and worship him. And perhaps you today who have been putting this off, today's the day. Will you do this? Will you bow the knee? Will you say to him, Lord, I believe and I worship you as my savior and my king. Hear the prayer of a man here and a woman there, Lord. Answer them. And rescue them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.